Okay, good, e good evening, everybody. I am Eric Renshard, and um, we will tonight we have this uh, webinar uh, from USOMI in collaboration with the company Osimis. And um, I will briefly introduce the speakers and the topics we are going to discuss. Um, something I also have to mention, of course, is the fact that after um, that during the lectures, you will be able to send questions in the Q&A box. We will have time uh, for discussion afterwards. Um, Pinar Ilmas is um, one of is my co-moderators, so we will moderate the questions and ask them to the speakers. And uh, yes, yeah, so please do not hesitate to send us uh, your questions. Um, so let me introduce you the speakers. First of all, well, I am the first speaker. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Eric Grenchard. I'm a radiologist in Eupen, Belgium. I'm visiting professor at Ghent University, and I'm also a USOMI committee chairman. My lecture will be about the cost and value of AI for radiology. Then we have Martin Liebel from uh, the Robert Schumann Hospitals in the Grand Duché of Luxembourg. And he will give a lecture about the most useful clinical AI use cases. And then the third speaker is Sergei Morozov. Uh, he's also a radiologist. And he, at this moment, he's the chief innovation officer at OSIMIS. He's also a USOMI committee chairman. And his lecture will, uh, the title of his presentation is AI pilots in a clinical setting. He will talk about um, the selection of AI applications and um, the possibilities offered by um, um, platforms to um, use such AI applications. Now let's start. I guess this is the first lecture. So I will talk about the cost and value of AI for radiology. Now, what are the current trends and challenges that we radiologists are confronted with? First of all, as you probably all know, we are confronted with an increasing workload there is an increasing demand for radiology that's already going on for several years now. The uh, examinations are increasing in complexity. We are increasingly involved in multi multidisciplinary meetings. So the role of radiologists is changing, which also uh, needs investment of time in such uh, duties. And of course, we the, the medicine is also changing towards a more personalized type of healthcare. And uh, other challenges that we are confronted with uh, on the other side are uh, budgetary constraints. Uh, this is due to several factors, as you know, as the pandemic and the energy costs that are increasing, and there's the inflation. But nevertheless, um, the entire healthcare sector is looking into budget sanitations to secure the necessary uh, financial savings. And these challenges, I guess, will only increase over time, making it crucial for the sector to start seriously investing in viable, cost-effective, and above all, sustainable solutions. And then we also are confronted with an increasing demand for sustainability in healthcare, which is uh, referring to the energy savings that we have to make. Um, this can also be related to contrast savings. So I mean the contrast media that we are using are costly and also cause pollution. Um, we have to think about using less radiation, and we also have to make uh, concern ourselves about the um, environmental issues of performing this or delivering these services. And then, of course, we do have capacity issues. Uh, the number of radiologists available is decreasing or is uh, in many places at its limits. Um, and this is certainly the case for on-call services. And this has to do with the increasing demand for subspecialty knowledge, of course, and there's also the budgetary constraints that we are confronted with. Just to demonstrate how the workload is increasing, this is a study from 2020 and uh, showing how the workload increased for only for CT scans during on-call uh, office hours. This is uh, based upon uh, an analysis of a 15-year trend in a Dutch non-academic teaching hospital and only for emergency scans. So the studies that increased in that period by more than 500% were CT of the head for trauma, brain CT angiography, chest CT angiography for pulmonary emboli, spinal, oh, sorry, I have to go back, spinal 
CT, neck CT, pelvic CT, and CT and geography for aortic dissection. Now, even the chest CT for suspected pulmonary emboli increased by 1,360% in those 15 years, and spinal CT increased by 1,720%. So this is really staggering, I think. There's another study uh, showing the eight-year trend in on-call workload. This is in a large tertiary academic medical center in Israel. And there they show that the radiologist's workload during on-call hours more than doubled the growth of the emergency department visit rate. So the visits in the emergency department increased by 23%, whereas the radiology load increased by 52%. Now, what are the challenges in the workflow that we are confronted with? So imaging is increasingly being used as a replacement for clinical triage. And this, of course, leads to longer report turnaround times, increasing backlogs, delayed reporting, and also a shortage in radiological capacity. Now, we should not forget that rapid communication of critical or urgent or unexpected findings is needed. So these examinations, they should be prioritized. And this is also what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, slides. But on the other hand, what we also see is that there's a number, an increasing number of AI applications for radiology. Now we have more than 200 CE mark products on the market. And as you can see on the graph on the right side, this is still increasing. Uh, most of these applications are pixel based and still have a very narrow scope and task. Um, the non-pixel-based AI tools for workflow management are still relatively scare, scarce. Now, what is the practical experience of using such tools in clinical practice? Um, in 2022, so that's very recent, there was an interesting publication in Insights into Imaging uh, reflecting on the current practical experience with AI in clinical radiology. This is a, a huge survey that was conducted and to which more than 270 radiologists participated from almost 230 institutions in 32 countries, which is really, really significant, I think. So what did this survey show? Well, you can see here that the most AI applications were being, have been or are being used for assistance during interpretation, which means detection, marking uh, of specific findings like nodules, emboli, et cetera. But the second most uh, goal of, of using AI tools was workflow prioritization, which is the case in 40% of the participants. Now, the experience of uh, those respondents that use AI for participation is relatively good. As you can see here, the majority, a large majority thinks that they are moderately helpful or very helpful in prioritizing examinations. Now, I will, as I said, I will focus on this issue, namely the prioritization and the assistance of AI for doing so. For what objectives can AI be implemented? Well, first of all, AI can be implemented in several parts of the radiological workflow. And the first part is, of course, to increase the efficiency of the workflow and, for example, to uh, decrease the reading time. So this belongs to the group efficiency improvement. But we can also use uh, AI applications to detect abnormalities early or to reduce even the radiation and contrast administration. Uh, we can also use them, of course, as you know, to improve the diagnostic accuracy. And in the end, and this is the, uh, let's say, um, most ideal goal is to assist us in uh, providing more personalized diagnostics and healthcare. So this is to uh, assist AI here, assist us in increasing the health services. But um, efficiency improvement can also be achieved with tools facilitating the prioritization of examinations, which means that they allow timely detection of urgent pathology, which should be beneficiary for the outcome of care. So here, the short reading time and the early detection overlap each other, and they can be combined to prioritize examinations. Now, AI and efficiency improvement. Well, AI can help us in shortening the reading and reporting time of the examinations. This should alleviate the workload. Prioritization of examinations, that should decrease the chances of dangerous delays in detecting urgent abnormalities. And besides the quality of the AI solution, of course, the optimal workflow integration is really crucial 
to achieve greater efficiency and to obtain the desired results. So to obtain the KPIs that we use to evaluate AI. Some examples of how AI tools can assist us in prioritizing uh, diagnosis. For example, we can think uh, about use cases like intracranial hemorrhage on CT or pulmonary emboli on routine CT or pneumothoraxes on chest X-ray or fractures on bone X-ray. Now, how can these results of uh, a prioritization tool be integrated with the workflow in our work list? Many algorithms not only detect a specific pathology such as a pulmonary embolus, but they can also classify a study as positive or negative or normal. Ideally, in the work list, one should not only have a colored marking um, as uh, when a study is positive, but also a prioritization of the examination to the top of the work list. So the letter depends on how the work list handles the results. In this case, it should be configured in the PACS RIS. And this is a work list from the Netherlands Cancer Institute where we also applied such a solution, which I will demonstrate. A first example, um, well, AI assisted detection of intracranial hemorrhage on non-contrast enhanced CT scans. Uh, a study was performed um, between 2017 and 19 in the USA in a busy academic neuroradiology practice. And there they saw that uh, AI uh, significantly reduced the wait time. So the uh, wait time was reduced with almost 24 or almost 25%. So they went from 12 minutes per study to almost 16, and they came from 16 uh, minutes. The AI resulted in a reduced overall turnaround time. Now, this is the way they applied the solution and they tested this. First of all, um, the algorithm, and this was the first phase, was introduced, uh, was shown as, a, or the results were shown as a pop-up widget on ancillary monitors. In the second phase, um, the results were shown as a marked examination in the reading work lists with a yellow flag here. And in the third phase, they were shown, the results were shown as a marked examination, but which was also reprioritized uh, in the top of the work list. So this is what the screenshots show. The left panel is with the widget only. The center panel is the yellow flag in the work list, and the right panel is the phase three, where the yellow flag and the reprioritization are uh, executed. These did not work. These did not have an effect. So only the, the last one, the flagging with reprioritization, did have an effect on the uh, efficiency. So the way results are communicated or displayed has a significant impact. So an ancillary widget and also a simple work list flag indicating hemorrhage had no significant impact on the examination waiting time. As you can see here, this is the basic time. These are the, the, the first two phases and the last phase, they had a win of three minutes only when the examination was really prioritized to the top of the work list. This is the second example of a study in which I participated at the Netherlands Cancer Institute. Um, it was published recently, last month actually, and um, the study is about um, detection and work list prioritization uh, for pulmonary emboli. Now, what type of uh, population did we have? We had more than 6,400 patients, oncology patients, which is more than 11,000 scans. And um, these scans were done routinely as a follow-up, as a routine follow-up for cancer patients during treatment. So what was evaluated during these, uh, this study is the diagnostic accuracy of the algorithm and also the temporal endpoints, uh, which were assessed at three uh, different moments, for, uh, at three different, um, let's say, studies. First of all, uh, these endpoints were measured in a routine workflow without AI. Then they were measured uh, in a uh, time in a period where we did manual triage without AI. And then in the second and the third, um, part of the study we did workless prioritization with AI. So what was the result? Uh, as you can see above, the sensitivity and specificity were very high, but also the median detection time of incidental pulmonary emboli, emboli reduced from several days to one hour in the practice with a backlog. There was a huge backlog of unreported examinations. So the key result is that AI 
prioritization of incidental pulmonary emboli on chest CT scans significantly reduced the time to diagnosis in patients with cancer. So what are the risks of prioritizations? Well, AI tools, they could create the risk of pushing false negative examinations too, too far down the list below the true and false positive examinations. So the potential clinical impact on the turnaround time for examinations with uh, relatively lower priority should be evaluated. So the potential side effects, of course. Um, so what findings have the highest priority? If we use different, different AI algorithms, so what findings would have the highest priority in the work list, including examinations of multiple modalities for multiple body parts? For example, should the head CT with one bleeding be prioritized above or below a CT chest with a pulmonary embolus and an extensive pneumonia, for example? Or what if the hemorrhage is larger than on yesterday's CT? So what examinations should be prioritized? So actually, when we do this, we will have to find methods to determine the appropriate priority, or we will need algorithms to prioritize the prioritizers. And so we will have to do further research in, into this domain to see what uh, effect the prioritization tools have on our workflow and on the clinical outcomes. And we will have to find ways to systematically monitor the performance of AI running in background for prioritization of examinations. Now, what are the main goals that we have to uh, keep in mind for implementing AI? First of all, the return on investment with AI can be achieved by increasing the value of our services on the condition that AI can assist us as in, in improving the diagnostic efficiency and also improving diagnostic quality and simultaneously in improving, and of course that's the ideal endpoint, in improving the clinical outcomes. So we should do that preferably not by increasing, but rather by lowering the costs. So that combination would be ideal. What is the future? A few words about that. I think that in the future, we will have AI that assist us in more extensively orchestrating our workflow. When thinking about, then I was thinking about, for example, about automated and integrated analysis of the clinical history and the questions that we are asked by referring clinicians. I also think about automated determination of optimal scanning protocols, ideally during the examination. These solutions already, already exist, by the way. I also think about automated assignment of ex examinations to radiologists depending on their expertise, their interpretation times, their availability, et cetera. I also think about automated preparation of examinations for reading. So the hanging protocol should be done automatically. The measurements should be made in background. And then of course, we can achieve a more equally distributed workload and also complexity among radiologists. And then should not forget, maybe we will achieve a time where AI can do a lot of automated reporting as well. And of course, in the future, we will achieve tools that have several purposes. For example, when analyzing a chest CT, um, several, an algorithm will be able to do several things simultaneously to analyze interstitial lung disease, to detect pulmonary nodules, or to detect emboli, to analyze coronary vessels, to quantify calcifications in those vessels, to see if the patient has osteoporosis, and to see what the body fat composition is, et cetera. AI will be, uh, ideally, AI would be able to make quantitative measurements and also to integrate radiomics with other data, such as radiogenomics. And this is one example of an algorithm that already exists. It's a non-gated chest CT scan where the calcium scoring is automatically performed in the heart. And of course, in the end, and this is the ultimate goal, AI will be able to predict the disease progression, for example, um, evaluate uh, to predict cognitive decline in and atrophy in Alzheimer's disease, or for example, uh, the therapeutic uh, achievements uh, in, by treating patients with multiple sclerosis. But to obtain those results, uh, the algorithms will have to be integrated with other systems such as the electronic patient records. So in this context, data and system interoperability are really essential. So what are my take home messages? First of all, AI, imaging AI with the properly trained models that can assist radiologists in improving their workflow, for example, by prioritizing examinations. Second take home message is that optimal integration with the existing operations and the systems 
is really essential to achieve the desired effects and the goals. And last, careful organizational preparation and permanent evaluation and monitoring of the applications will be needed to avoid harmful side effects. So I thank you for your attention, and I think we can move to the next presentation now. Thank you, Eric. Great lecture. Thank you so much. So I think it's Martin Liebel now. Yeah, exactly. Are you ready for that, Martin? Yes, I'm ready. Um, I will try to share my screen. Is that visible to everyone? Yes, we can see it. OK, perfect. Let's try this one. OK, so hello, everybody. My name is Martin Liebel. I'm a clinically active um, radiologist here in Luxembourg in the hospital of Kirchberg. And I uh, don't have any uh, of these fancy slides as uh, my colleague, Dr. Ranskart. Uh, the, um, uh, the message I want to give you or the insight I want to give you is really the practical part of our um, implementation of AI within our hospital, okay? So in Luxembourg, we were the first hospital to partner up with uh, Ozimis. And uh, since uh, almost four years now, we are under subscription for several AI tools. The two most important ones I want to present to you today. And this one is the, the first one is the tool for bone uh, fracture recognition. And the second one we use a lot is the one for detection of um, bleeding and also for uh, infarction in the brain within the perfu perfusion CT scan. Okay. Um, the thing that is really important and that I want to highlight here, and that was also a thing we wanted to evaluate first before using all these tools, was the implementation in the practical uh, workflow within the PAX system. Okay. So this would be the thing that I will emphasize the most we, uh, with you. When I present you these next uh, three cases I have prepared, uh, these cases are so. Uh, not only to show you that AI can really help you out as a radiologist, um, they are also um, prepared in a way that you can see how it is integrated into our PAX system and that you can uh, see for yourself if that could be helpful and if you can imagine that implementation in your own PAX system. Okay, so very important maybe to mention here on a technical basis is that first of all, when images leave the hospital with the Ozimis gateway. These are already uh, anonymized, okay? So there are never data with patient data mixed uh, that can be captured outside the hospital. That was really important for us and um, especially for our um, IT department. Okay, so let's move on to the first case. And I will give you some images of a knee a patient who has fallen, he comes to the emergency department, okay? In our workflow within the hospital, we can select um, not only patient lists that go directly to the uh, tool of Ozimis. It is the Gleamer tool we use uh, to detect fractures. We can also select on certain machines that are prioritized to make the uh, radio radiographs for the emergency department. Okay, so in this case, we have the right knee of a person who fell on it and automatically, without any intervention of radiologists or technicians, these images are sent via the um, Ozimis gateway in an anonymized fashion to the Gleamer tool, who does the uh, fracture recognition and gives back to us directly within a delay of 20 to 25 seconds, the results of his analysis, okay? So in practice, that means that if you are not constantly sitting on your list with examinations and you will have a certain delay of opening them, then you will never have these, will, you will never be under these 25 seconds. So every time when you open an exam, you will have the answer ready from Gleamer to help you analyze this um, case, okay? So um, uh, maybe you looked a bit at the images. I let them open for a time, but in this case, there was no fracture detected, okay? 
from the uh, human perspective. Uh, of course, we can see the, um, the uh, bleeding in the joint, but there is no fracture detected. Now I will present you the answer by Gleamer, how we see it in our PEX system, okay? So when you open the examination, we get both. We get the images uh, as they were made by the technician and directly or 25 seconds later, we have the images with the analysis by Gleamer. He's, he says to you how many uh, zones he finds suspicious. And he also mentions what he finds, okay? So the joint effusion he finds as well. And uh, it's marked by a, a box with a straight line. So he's very sure about that. But he also marks that he has a doubt on a fracture of the tibial plateau here at the back, okay? I, um, in pre when preparing the case, I looked again at the image and from a human point of view, it is really hard to see that something is wrong here. So even retrospective uh, analysis does not really help you here to see that there is a fracture or not. But that's the important part of the AI tool. He will not analyze it in the same way as you with the eyes. He has his algorithm to go over all the lines and pixels, and he will find a suspicion of a fracture. In this case, you could say that the joint effusion is reason enough to do a CT scan after uh, the uh, normal radiograph, if you want so. But still, I find it uh, rather imp impressive that the AI tool here detects something. And now I will present you the CT scan we did after that. And you can see that clearly here is a small fracture at the back of the tibial plateau. Uh, it was not uh, deplaced, but still on the primary X-ray, it was very hard to see, okay? In this case, I would say the AI tool has helped you with speed of the reading time, okay? So reading time goes down because you see things uh, faster and you can faster make the um, uh, decision to uh, perform the CT scan, okay? And of course, he will uh, indicate in this case, a region of interest. When you have poor clinical data, uh, it will be very hard to find this when you do not know if the, uh, the pain of the patient is rather at the patella or more the upper part of the knee, if he fell or uh, had a blunt trauma or had no trauma at all, okay? So in this case, I find it very, um, uh, supporting to have a, a second read of the AI, AI tool to help you analyze the images. A second case also of the Gleamer tool is a foot. In this case, um, we have a lot of, uh, of feet, uh, sorry, uh, that was too quick. We have a lot of feet uh, who are analyzed by X-ray. And the thing about the feet is that clinical data here is mostly very poor. And um, that makes it very hard to, uh, to see the fractures. You don't know if it's the toe or if it's the heel or if it was a trauma uh, when playing football or he fell from uh, a stair or something like that, okay? So it is um, quite a hard job to analyze all the bones when you do not know the exact location where to look, okay? In this case, a fracture can be seen, but it's very hard to see. Uh, but I will present to you first the, uh, normally I had the Gleamer presentation, no, the Gleamer tool um, detected here, a uh, fracture at this part, okay, when you zoom in, you can suspect uh, maybe that there is something here, and the CT scan later will show that if in, uh, there is really a fracture, no displacement, but you can see here the fractured line. And in that case, also the AI tool helps you to get the diagnosis uh, much faster. And it gives you the certainty of this second opinion when you have to do a quick look on a, a foot like that, where uh, a lot of bones can be broken and uh, the, the clinical data are not sufficient, okay? 
A second tool we use within our hospital, and that is also one that is uh, very helpful, is the tool of um, detection of brain infarction when we perform a perfusion CT scan, okay? Um, we don't have a lot of hard cases of brain infarction where really the, the question is if we need thrombolysis or not. That makes the number of cases rather low for our hospital. And then we are 10 radiologists in our department, okay? So the chances that you get um, a perfusion CT when you have your night shift are rather low. The reading of a perfusion CT is rather easy, okay? But the problem here is always the work through the analysis and the program to perform the perfusion charts on your blood volume, your uh, blood flow, and so on. And that one is the, the hard part when you have uh, a rather low number of cases of these perfusion CTs and uh, a, a high number of radiologists. So you will have not uh, so many cases per year. And then it's hard to uh, remember all the actions you need to do to analyze the data correctly. Okay. In this case, we use Icometrics uh, brain detection program. And uh, I will present to you, first of all, how we have the images in our PAC system. These are all the images we have in the PAC system from our CT acquisition. Okay. So we have the, can I? So we have the CT scan with vessel analysis we perform at first with the normal scan without contrast to detect uh, all the, uh, to exclude the bleedings and detect uh, signs of uh, ischemia on the non-injected CT scan. After that, we perform the perfusion CT. So the delay here should be after the first injection, normally the delay should be two to three minutes. So uh, when you prepare the perfusion CT, normally you get these two or three minutes to uh, perform another injection for the perfusion without problem, okay? So these are the data the, the CT scan uh, generates. And in our case with the Icometric system, also here we found it very important that the implementation of the uh, AI tool is uh, direct and fully automated, okay? So the scan will be performed. You can discuss with the neurologist present the symptoms and the indications of eventual, eventual thrombolysis. And in this time where you can discuss clinics and uh, symptoms, the AI tool receives automatically all the data from our perfusion and can do the reading and analysis on that. Of course, all this happens in an anonymized fashion after uh, passing through the Ozimis gateway, okay? And then within like five minutes, you get the answer from the IcoBrain uh, cerebral infarction tool, okay? So he will present to you all the um, color charts on the mean transition time, cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, Tmax, and so on. He will do that automatically. He will present to you as well a PDF and an analysis of uh, areas of interest with uh, volume measurement of the infarcted areas and also the P number, okay? So he will differentiate for you um, already the, the dead brain tissue and the penumbra and measure them in volumes in milliliters, so you can decide whether uh, action is required with thrombolysis or um, uh, uh, intra-arterial treatment to, um, to get the thrombus out, okay? Uh, next slide is the larger images of this automated analysis, but already in an automated fashion, these are integrated in the PACS system, okay? So when you discuss the case uh, at the CT scanner with the patient and the neurologist, the time you take to get back to your uh, reading uh, station, you will already have the answer with the fully automated analysis of the brain tissue and tissue damage, okay? This is the example of our PDF file. In this case, there was no infarction, but you can see that he presents to you 
the areas of high Tmax and the areas of high Tmax and low blood flow, uh, where you can make the differentiation of volume between that area and um, penumbra. Okay. Also, you can take a look at the areas, uh, the curves he took for arterial and venous vessel analysis. So you can uh, have a quick look to see that there is no big mistake made here by the analyzation tool. And that's about it for my three cases. I hope I could demonstrate to you in a, in a good and practical way how we implement these systems um, in our reading process. And um, with Ozemis, um, we, we have achieved uh, a very high automation of uh, the workflow. So selection of patients from emergency department and the machines who uh, make the radiograms of the emergency department is made automatically. The images are sent automatically to the Ozemis gateway for analysis. And within 20 seconds, we have the fracture analysis within the PACS system. So you can use them for your reading and uh, for reporting. And the same way it functions with the Icometrics brain uh, tissue analysis for brain infarction. We have other tools for uh, brain analysis for dementia to measure uh, brain volume and um, multiple scler sclerosis. These are uh, semi-automatic for the moment. So these images need to be selected and sent to the AI tool via the gateway. Uh, but also here, the analysis is fully automatic and the re response is also automatically integrated in the PAX system. And that's why we uh, like working with uh, Ozemis and um, the, the platform in, uh, um, uh, very much because it, they uh, um, achieved uh, this automated way of working without any um, additional clicks for the radiologist. This was very important for us. Okay. So I hope I could demonstrate to you um, the working of some of the most important AI tools and how they are integrated in the PAX system and uh, how you can maybe also increase efficiency and decrease reading time with the integration of these tools via the um, Ozemis Gateway. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I think we can now proceed with Sergey's uh, presentation. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. So I, I have an honor and the pleasure of actually connecting the dots because I will try to, to combine what uh, uh, Eric has perfectly um, uh, presented to us as his vision. And actually, this is absolutely obvious where the industry is going. And uh, Martin has perfectly demonstrated how practically this is important, how useful it is. So I will try to connect the dots and uh, I will try to keep beyond um, uh, below the, the time allocation. Uh, so without further ado, so here are my disclosures, which I need to demonstrate. Uh, and so in summary, and medical imaging, uh, it allows us to do more of radiology, of, of the real radiology uh, with less resources. I mean, by spending less time on the chores, on the routines. And of course, AI is not re replacing a human, but transforming the roles and enhancing uh, the capabilities and the um, uh, capacity of the hospital. And AI allows hospitals to decrease the cost of the routine work and repurpose the scarce workforce on the higher reimbursed procedures. This is absolute value of the current AI. Um, and, and I would like uh, to briefly remind you of the diagnostic stages in order to transition further in the, in the demonstration of uh, how to select AI and for which purposes. So every diagnostics procedure uh, or other interpretation of the diagnostic results starts from assessing the pretest probability of, of uh, the disease. So what are the clinical data? What is the reason for the referral for the imaging? Then we always ensure the patient's identity. So to be sure that we interpret correct images of the correct uh, patient. And of course, there's a, uh, there's a significant value of IT systems behind the first and the second stage of diagnostics. Then we proceed over to the perception stage. So we scroll through 
we do the cine mode analysis of, let's say, CT, and we do the basic differentiation between norm or negative and positive study. And at that stage, multiple uh, studies uh, are completed for analysis. The, the, the analysis is complete at this stage because it's normal study, you know, that for X-ray, for chest X-ray, for mammography, those could be 90% of normals or 95% of normals. And at that stage, the highest sensitivity is required in order not to miss any pathology. The next stage then is the pattern recognition. So we found something, we have found something. There's a positive finding, which provides major or cross radiologic diagnosis. And we need now to utilize high specificity in order to define, so what is that? What, what does it correspond to? And then we use deduction, induction, and abduction in order to do the differential diagnosis and categorize the finding with, for example, stage, uh, birets, lyrets, pirates, whatsoever, resist, and so on and so forth. And for that stage of diagnostics, we need extensive knowledge, experience, and general intelligence. So that stage of diagnostics is very difficult to, to be achieved by artificial intelligence, but third and fourth stage, and of course, the, the first and the second stage also, uh, so those first four stages, they're perfectly well supported by, by the current AI. And finally, communication of the results in the timely, actionable, and reliable manner and the format, of course, is crucial. This is performed usually with the utilization of the, of the wisdom. And here comes sensitivity and specificity. So just to remind you, sensitivity, the mnemonic is SN and out, meaning that the negative result of highly sensitive test allows to rule out a diagnosis. While for the specificity, the positive result of the highly specific test allows to rule in a diagnosis. And usually we always need on the basic level, the, the prerequisite, we have a prerequisite for the highest sensitivity in order not to miss a pathology. So not to do any harm by missing, you know, that the, mo the majority of liability uh, cases uh, around the world, especially in the USA are related to missed trauma, missed lung cancer, missed breast cancer. So these are the, the pathologies um, uh, which when missed, are facing the major um, liability fines and uh, court um, uh, and court cases. Uh, and this is an example. So how we calculate sensitivity and specificity. And the basic is the highest sensitivity not to miss a pathology. That's why I'm taking as an example, chest X-ray AI with 95% sensitivity and just not, not really high, but 80% specificity. Even with those levels of accuracy, if we take a patient flow of 1,000 patients who are referred for chest X-ray, that would mean that radiologists reporting 1,000 studies would find 100, uh, let's say 10% prevalence, 100 positive cases, 900 uh, negative cases. And that would uh, also be associated with approximately 50 errors. Well, according to the general number of errors in the diagnostics, maybe even more, or oh, not errors, but discrepancies. And the time spent on that would be more than 30 hours, let's say two minutes per chest X-ray. Well, we, we can use any numbers here. Of course, it depends on the local practice, but let's say two minutes. If radiologist uses AI in the format that Eric has demonstrated, and Martin also demonstrated for bone X-ray, and we spend less time on the studies which are indicated as negative by AI, we drastically reduce both the number of errors and the amount of time to be spent on reporting the same thousand of uh, studies because we will be reviewing the normal negative studies much more faster. And that brings huge efficiency gain, which is even with AI of 95% sensitivity, 80% specificity, is uh, on the level of 70% gain efficiency, meaning almost doubling the efficiency of the radiology department, which is, which is huge. And this is the reference level. And of course, we can transpose, we can um, uh, scale that to other clinical, to other imaging modalities. We can scale that partially to CT, to, for example, for um, uh, chest CT, uh, Eric has demonstrated uh, perfusion imaging, uh, brain imaging. Uh, we can partially uh, also scale that over to MRI, to other X-ray modalities. And all in all, that means that almost 70% of studies in the general hospital within two or three years to come can be uh, automatically reported, meaning the preparation of the draft report. So computer vision 
of pixel-based AI to recognize pathology, uh, to classify the pathology, and then radiologist spends just a little bit of time to finally make the decision about the correct diagnosis. And uh, with a, a higher level of quality, the, with a higher level of accuracy, the radiologist is able to do even more. So looking at the examples that Martin has demonstrated, I'm thinking that we should really train radiologist residents with AI augmented studies, because this is absolutely new level of accuracy when you can see what is not really properly or obviously seen on the X-ray images. And that means that imaging also becomes much more wider, accepted and understood by different specialties. So this is really another level, imaging 3.0, or as Frederick, uh, Eric was demonstrating there, uh, imaging uh, new level of uh, chest CT with recognition of multiple uh, radiomics within the same chest CT study, kind of opportunistic uh, scanning. This is really another level of image. And with that in mind, uh, the question is how to select uh, solutions which are able to do that. And we see that uh, within uh, recent, uh, I'm taking here, I think 10 years or something like that, 144,000 papers have been published on AI in medical imaging, including radiology, lung cancer, nature, Lancet, and multiple journals. And, and the number of publications is getting higher and higher. And as you know, there are more than 400 FDA certified uh, uh, solutions already. So the question is how to make the choice, how to make the selection. And that's why um, uh, I have started with my colleagues, the project of uh, building, building uh, AI ranking or evidence-based ranking in order to, to, uh, to use the existing methodology to analyze the quality of publications, basically start, of course, analyzing the quality uh, of the diagnostic imaging publications, and then to, to build comparative uh, ranking. So in order to do that, we have collected peer-reviewed publications with prevalence and sensitivity specificity, uh, with the definition of target pathology. Uh, we, uh, I have considered prevalence of less than 10% as kind of screening scenario, with the uh, uh, low probability of disease and above that kind of confirmatory diagnostic scenario. I know that it's not perfect, but we, we should have used something for um, uh, definition of the scenario, uh, which is uh, applied in the, in the um, specific study. And I have taken three domains, chest X-ray, trauma X-ray and uh, mammography. So we have collected the papers and uh, I have also suggested to define the kind of uh, reference level of accuracy. So for the screening scenario, let's say 95% sensitivity and 80% specificity is something which is good for screening, as I have demonstrated in the modeling exercise. What is conditionally accepted is, let's say, 85-85, but AUC should be high enough, because then we can, um, um, we can modify the threshold of uh, AI solution and uh, push higher sensitivity, of course, with the, with the, uh, in, um, uh, the trade of uh, specificity. But the value of that kind of AI is to triage and to filter out negative. For the confirmatory diagnostics, sensitivity should remain high. This is prerequisite, 95%, ideally. And specificity should be even higher, 90% or, or even higher, because we need to confirm the diagnostic. So we need to, to rule in uh, the, the diagnosis. And uh, of course, here, uh, the quality of AI in terms of specificity should be, should be much higher, also con considering potential differential diagnosis. And now, then we started to analyze solutions. So this is the list of um, mammography AI solutions which exist on the market. The thing is that not all of them are based on the actual evidence, published papers. So we have selected all possible papers uh, peer-reviewed certainly uh, papers uh, for Lunit, uh, for TerraPixel, for iCAT, for um, uh, ScreenPoint, Vara, Heron, uh, and uh, here's the link. Uh, you can follow this link to see the full table. And we started to analyze those papers with the reference of those 9580 or 9590 uh, reference levels of um, uh, accuracy, which is really clinically useful in order not to miss the pathology and to really make the make the value. The analysis is quite complicated. I uh, am looking forward to publish the, the paper uh, on that, um, uh, but I'm happy to present the preliminary results. We did, we've done the same for chest X-ray, 
also taken even longer list of publications because you can imagine that on chest X-ray much more has been published. So you can see here Annalise, uh, Lunit, Oxipit, um, uh, Cure AI, and their uh, sensitivities and, and specificities. And you can see even from those numbers, from those tables, that there is a huge heterogeneity in what is published, even for very well known AI. So the the uh, the data are really super heterogeneous, making the um, uh, the conclusion reaching uh, a, a tedious, a difficult to work. And then we did the same for trauma X-ray uh, AI, also taking all the papers for uh, Glimmer, for Azetmet, for imaging technologies, for you see many, many, many papers. And in the original, uh, I also have the link to the uh, complete uh, table. Uh, I think that there are approximately 50 papers or something like that. So there, there are really many of them and we are updating the list in order to keep it, uh, to keep it up to date. So with that in mind, uh, by comparing the existing and uh, published data, so we, we haven't analyzed anything under NDA. So this is all based on the, on the published data, on the open access data. We see that for chest X-ray, there are four leaders on the market according to their research base, Analyse, Lunit, Oxipit, and Cure AI. For mammography, the current leaders are Heron, Lunit, ScreenPoint, and Vara. And uh, for trauma, as it meant, Glimmer, Milview, <laughs> everything is in the alphabetic order without any, any um, uh, preferences. And um, uh, of course, there are more papers coming up and we shall be updating that um, uh, ranking of AI solutions with new data becoming available. So as a conclusion, so there is an obvious proven accuracy gain with AI implementation for mammography, chest trauma X-ray reporting, reaching the point of automated triage and negative studies autonomous reporting. Leading uh, services can be identified according to the published papers. The highest diagnostic accuracies are above 95% for sensitivity and specificity, which, which is really high and which is demonstrated uh, perfectly well by uh, Martin's practical cases. The reported accuracy of a standalone AI is significantly, significantly higher than that of specialists in many, many cases, because I will hint you, probably maybe not all of you know that, but the accuracy of radiologists is not 100%. And uh, papers on mammography have demonstrated perfectly well, you can see it here, the reported accuracy of a radiologist for mammography is sensitivity, 52 up to 83%, and specificity, specificity is 63 up to 77%. So this is quite far from 100%. And this is actually uh, is similar to the widely reported uh, percentage of discrepancies in the radiology report on the level of about 20% average in different studies. Of course, not all those all those discrepancies are critical for diagnosis. Some of them are minor, but but still. And the reported accuracy for AI is higher, uh, which certainly justifies its wider and wider usage. But of course, further studies are needed uh, related to the real uh, world uh, evidence. Of course, there are limitations of that uh, study. And uh, this is what uh, is platform providing because that's how we build the selection. That's what we provide from the platform. That's how we select the AI vendors. And this is the way uh, a platform uh, as Ozemis uh, proposes to its clinical partners to try and to test different AI solutions. For example, Hostel is not traded to onboard AI as Martin has done that for a long period of time, for four years, but would like to try how it would work on their data. So that's what we do by directly integrating AI into the clinical workflow and by building roadmaps of future usage of AI for clinical partners. So with that in mind, come join us at, uh, first of all, in September at uh, ESOI meeting in PISA, uh, which is uh, led by uh, our dear friend, Emmanuel Neri. And then in October, uh, also in PISA, uh, getting there for another beautiful meeting organized by USOMI, uh, AI connecting the dots and follow the publications by uh, you saw me members and the board. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so right. much. Thank you very much. Yes, this is a very interesting presentation, Sergey. Uh, an impressive analysis that you've made. I have many questions, but just one simple question. Um, will the results of your analysis be published or made available somewhere? How can we uh have a look into this information yes thank you eric thank you so much so we have uh, uh assembled a small uh, initiative group within usomi 
Uh, so the uh, Jakob Wieser, uh, Merrill, uh, and uh, uh, Renato, uh, and um, uh, Tugba. So the, there are several people who work on that, who cooperate on that group to essentially uh, transform that into the into the publication. Uh, uh, I hope in the European Radiology, which is uh, the deputy chief of which is uh, Daniel Pinto de Daniel Pinto de Santos. And another direction is that we would um, assemble a automated uh, dashboard. On the website, in order to to make that interactive, uh, to to scroll through, to to compare, uh, I think to make you know face to face comparisons. So for example, I'm looking for AI for food analysis. So which are the papers? I, I select food, and I see the comparison of the uh, data published for for the food X-ray. So that that's what we have started to work on. Yes, that's interesting. So I hope uh, the. Uh company will provide that information on the website soon i think that yes. would be very we'll useful and of course if the if the clients can provide feedback because this is something that at this moment is still kind of missing in the in the clinical application is the possible ways to provide feedback on the functionality of algorithms because we all know they are not perfect i mean um, they can make mistakes they can make errors today i saw one with Gleamer, because we also work with the Osimus platform on Gleamer. But on the other hand, radiologists may also, also make errors and uh, where the algorithm is doing things correctly, but nevertheless, things can be improved. So the way to provide feedback should be very useful. And I think that's quite essential. So this is also what I understood from Martin's presentation. Of course, it's very useful. I agree with him. I've also, uh, we are also using the same application uh, the bone view application in clinical practice, and it's very helpful. I can certainly uh, confirm that. I have one question for Martin because yeah. we don't have much time. But uh, one of the things that uh, are intriguing uh, for me is the way that emergency physicians are handling this and reacting on this. I mean, uh, first of all, I saw that. Um, as you know, the bone view algorithm also gives sometimes doubt cases. And I saw that the emergency physicians, if they're not well prepared or they don't know how the algorithm is working, that this creates kind of uncertainty among them so that they start calling the radiologist. Uh, what's your experience with that? How do your emergency physicians react on the implementation or don't they have access to the results? No, uh, they have access. It's free for everyone in the PECs. Um, and okay, now we are uh, running it for almost four years. So everybody is uh, has gotten used to it. But in the beginning, of course, there was a lot of um, telephones ringing. Um, and uh, also, I have the uh, the um, impression that the, the the tool itself improved over the years. So in the beginning, it was certainly not that good uh, as it is now. Uh, so there were more for, um, uh, fortif, uh answers in the PEC system. And then uh, you get phoned, yeah, you wrote, there is no fracture, but here there is this small box. Is this not something? And uh, should I do something about that? Okay, because you said there is not nothing and there is still this image, but now uh, they are they they're got, they've gotten used to it and um, like the final report of the radiologist is really the thing that counts and um, uh, yeah there's yeah, there are no is, back, is, more questions this is also mentioned on the result of the algorithm right that this is not the final result that it's only exactly which yeah. is important by the way on the other hand and maybe that's also an interesting question what do you do as a radiologist if you have another opinion than the algorithm do you mention this in your report or don't you mention it at all yeah that depends on the radiologist so i i am one of these uh, who, who does not really mention it uh, i i yeah i sometimes uh, give an opinion on the the result of the uh, of the algorithm but not so often but others they always mention the outcome of the algorithm Okay, so they say I see a fractured algorithm says negative, but that doesn't matter or other the other way around. And um, of course, it can be uh, it, it can be questioned, but um, in in our case, it enhances uh, sometimes the dialogue with the, the um, doctor of the emergency department because you don't see anything. The algorithm does find something, and then uh, you can ask back where does it hurt or uh, is this really the place where the fracture could be 
and uh, yeah, that's maybe a really good thing. I think it's These very are... sure, it's very sure that the algorithm shows us more than we would usually see. Uh, that's the case. So even when the algorithm sees a doubt case, that might be something that we wouldn't have thought of even. So that's yeah. certainly my experience that we do that we're more uh, triggered to see more things. And then, of course, you have to communicate correctly about this. So, but Pina, I'll leave the question to you. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was going to uh, say the same thing as uh, this is, these are leading questions at our department as well. How do we communicate with uh, clinicians uh, regarding uh, these tools and how well are they informed and in how to use them or interpret them? Because they can see in some clinics, I understand they can also see the results before there is, there even is a radiological report um, and um, to get to the st standardized reporting right in uh, within one department as well to have uh, a clear interpretation for the clinician to go further on with their um, treatment as well because if um, as you mentioned we uh, everybody has their own style or, or their own self communicating through the reports um, I think that's also something to be very clear with uh, within clinicians, it's easier. I mean, within G with the GPs, we also have a lot of x-rays or um, fracture detection coming from the GPs, which is harder to communicate, right? Because it's, we don't often, we don't have them, um, we have to call them or uh, we don't have the clinical exam uh, as it should be. Yeah. Um, and there's another thing I really wanted to ask, because this is also an uh, important discussion we um had before uh, in how to get the feedback. So as I understood the platform, um, there are different AI vendors, right? There's different AI tools regarding their sensitivity, specificity, and uh, how they perform. Um, how does the user get back their feedback? Uh, and is that via OSIM, OSIM is, or is it going back to the vendor as well? Uh, and how does that work? So, so there, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Peter. That, that's really great, great, great question uh, because uh, um, th that's essentially the cycle. So PDCA cycle whatsoever, you need a uh, feedback loop always. In any system, you need a, you need a feedback loop. And that mm -hmm. makes sense both for, for the clinical users, for vendors, uh, for everyone involved. So the, the ways to do that, some of AI vendors are incorporating QR code directly on their image which you can scan and you can directly shoot their, your uh, disagreeing, for example, disapproval of the result back to, to AI. The, the next level, which I think is even better, is kind of a cancel button in the PEX. So this is doable together with PEX vendor. When you click the cancel button, the result is deleted because you think that the result is completely unacceptable. You know, everyone, everybody makes mistakes. You can you shoot the cancel. The result is deleted from your local packs, and essentially it would not get uh, Eric, as you were mentioning, over to um, physicians, to referring physicians, to emergency physicians, and at the same time the feedback goes uh, goes to the to the vendor. Mm -hmm. uh, another level is to to build that through the uh, platform, but the idea is that we should limit in any possible way any extra piece of software. So there mm -hmm. should be a button within mm -hmm. packs or directly on the image for, image, for example, QR code. So that's, to my understanding and knowledge, I think the better ways to do it. Okay, thank you very, very thank much, you. Sergey. This is a clear answer. I'm afraid we're running out of time, but I we can conclude. I mean, the two main conclusions that I can make is that AI tools are proven to be very useful and helpful. That's one. Secondly, we should think about how to communicate results, not only to clinicians, but also to patients. So this is also a, a, a next topic to discuss about, I think. And the other thing is also the, the way how we can facilitate the communication and the provision of feedback to the vendors and developers uh, about the, uh, let's say, accuracy and the usefulness of their tools. So um, I would like to thank you all very much for your input. This was very interesting and very relevant. And I hope uh, we can uh, repeat this soon in, a, in a, a similar way. Thank you very much. Thank, you, Thank you so much. Thank you all. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice Thank evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Pina. Bye. Bye-bye.